Turn with me to Psalm chapter 5. It was read in the ESV. I'm setting a clock right now just in case. It was read in the ESV this morning. I would like to take just a few minutes to read it in the, the authorized version just to, because we'll be switching back and forth. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice thou shalt hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, and the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy them, O God, O let them fall by their own counsels, cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Let us pray. Lord, we extol Thee. You are our God and our King. We bless Your name forever and ever. Every day we will bless You and praise Your name forever and ever. Great are You, Lord, and greatly to be praised, and Your greatness is unsearchable. You, Lord, are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, You are good to all, and Your mercy is over all that You have made. Father, as we study now Psalm chapter 5, open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts to allow us to glean the truths that are revealed within. In your name we pray, amen. Now, <clears throat> we won't nearly have as much introduction today. Um, psalm 5 is, as you see in the superscription, is a psalm of David. As with Psalm 4, we are also never given a context by which we can place this psalm. There's been many theories provided by theologians which have attempted to place this psalm within a particular context, but as uh, one theologian notes, in the absence of the light the author doesn't give us, any opinion must be purely conjectural. And so, like last week, we will, or two weeks ago, we will consider this psalm with some generality, some vagueness. The superscription, just in a way of passing, says that the psalm was written to the choir master, or if you're using uh, the authorized version, the chief musician. Uh, the psalm was to be played, and pardon my pronunciation, but if you read the authorized version, it says the nihilith, which is, there is some debate, which we won't go into, but uh, most typically it's considered to the flutes or to the wind instruments. As the psalm last week was written, intended to be played on the string instruments, this one was intended to be played on the uh, wind instruments, which is why you see in the superscription uh, for the flutes in the ESV. But uh, we will progress. I want to make note of uh, some observations. Actually, I want you to make note of some of these observations. So if you have a pencil and a pen, I think it would help us as we progress through uh, this psalm, if you're willing, to jot some notes. If you like to take notes during sermons, this would be a perfect time. Uh, not what I say. Don't, don't necessarily jot down what I say, but jot down what you learn. Primarily, I want you to do three things. I want you to note what you learn about God. Keep track of what you learn about God, his nature, his behavior, his actions, etc., and etc. And secondly, I want you to note or jot down or observe two types of people that are revealed in this psalm. The righteous and the unrighteous. Jot down notes of their behavior, their nature, and their actions. 
Uh, in the psalm, David will stand in the place of the righteous. He will take the, the place of the righteous in the psalm, but eventually extends this place to all those who take refuge in God or put their trust in the Lord. And then finally, I want you to note that the Lord's actions against these two people. What is the Lord's thoughts and actions against these two types of people, respectively? In doing so, I think we will be left with the psalmist's intention for his readers and what the Lord would have us to read here today. And so let's begin in Psalm chapter 5, verse 1. The psalmist says, Give, ears, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. We'll continue in just the first section of verse 2. Give attention to the sound of my cry. The first thing we note, and this by way is what we learn about God, that David uses a specific name for God here. You see, Lord all capitalized. This is signifying that the psalmist is using the term Jehovah. Now, Jehovah, from, from what we know, is essentially a Germanic pronunciation of the Latin translations for the Hebrew term Yahweh. Okay? So David is addressing Yahweh. This is the, the Jewish national name of God. Uh, Jehovah means the self-existent or the eternal God. This name is derived uh, from God's reference to himself in Exodus chapter 3, where he says to Moses, I am that I am. This God, this Jehovah, Yahweh, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is the God who David petitions in Psalm 5. So he says, give ear to my words, O Lord. This is David's plea. This is to say, I mean, it's just a way to say, be attentive to or take regard to my prayers. This is not the God of the prophets of Baal. If you remember, uh, when Elijah was fighting against the prophets of Baal, they said, um, if you read in 1 Kings chapter 18, he says, call out to the prophets of Baal. And they did, and they cried out to him. And what did the prophets, what did the prophets of Baal hear? They heard nothing, no response. No voice was heard, this text says. But then Elijah cries out to Yahweh, to Jehovah, and the Lord answers. This is the prayer. This is the the plea for David. David's plea is that God would attend to that which he was about to pray. He, was, he continues by saying, consider my groanings or meditation. Now to consider is to understand or, or perceive. Thus David is saying, hear the words of my prayer, Lord, and consider, understand, or perceive my meditations or groanings. So what does he mean by groanings or meditation? Now the phrase David uses denotes the innermost desires of the heart, my thoughts, the secret, unexpressed desires of the soul. One theologian says that he asked God to think upon the things which now fills his own soul with thought. And the idea is this, that David realizes that he was unable to put into adequate words what his heart was feeling. The, the, the real prayers of his heart he was unable to express. And so David asked God to consider and understand his heart. What, what does this reveal to us about God? It reveals to us that God is not only a God who will hear our verbal prayers, but he can know the innermost thoughts of our heart and soul. How comforting it is to us, his children, to know that even though we may be in such sorrow, in such despair, or such fear that the words escape us. I'm sure we've all been at times in such moments of, of heartache that we don't even know what to pray. David says, the Lord can hear your heart. Even though you are speechless, God still hears your prayer. This is a sign of God's omniscience. It's a great source of comfort as it was to David And Paul actually later takes this up in Romans chapter 8, where he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, same word, with groanings too deep for words. 
And he, the Lord, searches, who searches the heart, knows what it is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The same idea. The Spirit intercedes for you because you do not know how to pray as you ought. In some cases, we do, can't even pray because we are at a loss for words. Isaiah picks up this idea. The same word is used in Psalm 5, which gives a little bit of a, a nuance. Isaiah says, like a swallow or a crane, I chirp. I moan like a dove. And the idea he's giving is the, the quiet groanings or moanings of a dove is how he prays. And yet the Lord still hears. Bloomer notes that, Blessed be God who knows all the soul troubles of his servants and hides not his face from their inexpressible groanings or their unutterable sighs. In the same way that God heard the prayers of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1.13, though she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, the text says, but her voice was not heard, God hears our heartfelt groanings and our unutterable dove-like moanings and the innermost thoughts of our hearts and how comforting that should be to us to know even when we are mute and not speaking God knows our hearts and he hears our prayers David continues give attention to the sound or voice of my cry David has asked God to hear the words of his prayers in the first part of uh, Psalm 5 verse 1 and now, he, then he says, consider my groanings or the thoughts of my heart. Now David says, Lord, give ear or hearken to, give attention to the crying out of my voice. John Calvin notes that David expresses one thing in three different ways. This repetition denotes the strength of his affection and his long perseverance in prayer. It's kind of this idea that David says, I have prayed to you in every way I know possible. I pray to you with loud groanings, with loud cries. I pray to you with mere words, and I'm praying to you when I don't know what to pray in my heart. And Lord, hear my cries, hear my prayers. The, the term cry there in, in, second, in, in verse 2, it denotes an emphaticness, a loud outcry of weeping, as if the person was in great distress. David was in such distress that he was crying out with a piercing utterance. And the seriousness of David's calamity has called him to cry out his prayers before God. You know, Christ himself prayed such prayers, as we learned in Hebrews. Pastor Jason has gone through Hebrews. Hebrews 5, 7 notes, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence and how comforting it is to us again that God hears our prayers whether they are unutterable groanings or ways or wails of despair and Spurgeon that great wordsmith says to a loving father his children's cries are like music and they have magical influence which his heart cannot resist the ideas of a father taking joy in the fact that his child comes to him for comfort and solace in their times of grief and despair or heartache. Now, let's direct our attention to the remainder of verse 2. David says, Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. Notice that David's words, the Lord Jehovah, was David's King and God. Jehovah was David's king and, and David his subject. Jehovah was David's God and David was his worshiper. But notice also the personal touch. He's not saying that God, you are simply king and God. No, he's saying you are my king and my God. A uh, theologian named John Gill says, the Lord was David's king in a civil sense and in a spiritual sense. Though Though David was king over others, yet the Lord, who is the king of kings, was king over him. And he was his God, as being his covenant God and father in Christ, the God of all grace in whom David loved, believed in, and worshipped as his God. This Jehovah is the king of kings and, gods of, and God of gods, 
There is none greater than he. Thus, to him, to him only, does David direct his prayers. David says, for unto thee will I pray, or for to you do I pray. So how then does David go about praying? Look at verse 3. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch. The authorized version says, I direct my prayer unto thee, and look up. In the morning, David directs his petitions to God. He seeks God early, as, and that means in some word way to, uh, to seek him in an earnest sense, earnestly. It denotes an, an intentionality in David's prayer life. David begins intentionally his day by making his petitions to the Lord. And one theologian says that the man who gives his first waking thoughts to God will not be indisposed to acts of devotion at later hours of the day. This is a resolution, if you will, of David. He is committing himself to waking up in the morning and praying. Now, if you're following along uh, in an in a, in a authorized version, a King James version, you'll notice a, a slight difference in the end of uh, verse 3, the ESV says, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. The King James says, I direct my prayer unto thee and look up. And the reason for this, it's, it's quite interesting, is that the word which David uses, direct, uh, it means to set in a row or to arrange or to put in order. And so David is saying, I'm setting my prayers before you. I'm arranging them before you. That is to direct them to the Lord. The same word is used when the priest would walk into the temple or the tabernacle and arrange the sacrifice upon the altar or arrange the showbread upon the table. It's the same word. That's why the ESV takes it as a sacrifice. And so I think either way it gets across the point that David is arranging his prayers, whether that is by way of sacrifice or whether that is by way of direction, he is arranging or laying his prayers before the Lord in the sense that he is directing them towards God. Now, having made his petitions, David watches or looks up. Now, he uses here an interesting uh, uh, metaphor or image, that of a tower watchman. Who has, he knows of a messenger who has been sent out, and he is waiting for the first sight of this messenger to return. And so David says, like a tower watchman, I am watching you, Lord, and waiting for your answer. That's kind of the idea. David is saying, I am awaiting eagerly, expect, expecting, that was my hillbilly came out, sorry, expecting the Lord to answer my prayers. Thus, David says, he wakes up early to present his prayers to the Lord, and having done so, he waits expectedly for his Lord's answer. Let us pause here just for a moment and reflect as to whether David's prayer life reflects our own. Do we pray intentionally? Earnestly, do we pray early? Do we thoughtfully arrange our prayers before the Lord? And do we look for an honest and eager expectation of the Lord's reply? I've got to be honest with you. When I was studying for this sermon, and all the times that I've studied for sermons, I've prepared for sermons, this text has been the most challenging and wonderful to study. It really has. And if I could give you just simply 10% of the joy that I had in studying for this song, if I can have you leave with that, I, I would be glad. This is absolutely a wonderful song. Do we look for the Lord's reply? Do we play? So let's continue. Why does David wait in eager expectation of the Lord's reply? Verse 4, he says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. See, up till now, the reader has been informed of the, uh, has not been informed of the content of David's prayers. 
In the same way, we are not given specific details. However, from what we can ascertain, his prayers were against his enemy. They were against those who opposed him, those who spoke poorly of him. Spurgeon notes that he is pleading against his cruel and wicked enemies. He begs, uh, to be put, for, he begs of God to put them away because they were displeasing to God himself. That's a good way to pray, by the way. Pray in accordance to the will and character of God. God, you hate the wicked, put them away. So you can at least see the basis of David's prayer. Deal with my enemies, Lord, because they are wicked and because you are not a God who delights in wickedness. They are evil, and evil may not dwell with you, so put them away. So what do we learn about God? We learn that God does not delight in wickedness. Pretty simple. Nor does evil dwell with him. So God is holy. God is righteous. And as such, he abhors sin. He hates sin. And David has invoked a, a different name for God here, by the way, if you notice. For you are a God. You are not a God. The word he uses is El, or, or God, which signifies a, the strong or mighty God. The Almighty. The term he's using is the Almighty God. What shall we say to this then? That God is righteous and takes no pleasure in wickedness? Nor evil shall dwell with him? And what does it mean to us then? To the, what does it mean to the men who are wicked, who are unrighteous and, and evil? It means that God cannot dwell with such men. And I would submit to you that such men are we. We are such evil men. We are such wicked men. We are the unrighteous. How then will any man stand before this righteous and holy God who does not take delight in wickedness and does not per permit evil in his presence? And I think David answers that for us in verse 6, or in verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. The authorized version says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speakest leasings. The Lord will abhor the bloody and the deceitful man. How then will any man stand before God who takes no pleasure in wickedness? The simple answer is they won't. They won't. We won't. It, the foolish or boastful will not stand before God's eyes or before his sight. The term here, the foolish or boastful, it describes a person or a fool who celebrates his foolishness. He boasts of it, hence boastful. Elsewhere interpreted proud or profane or insane boaster or transgressor of the law. Why? Why will they not stand in his presence? Because God has no pleasure in wickedness. And by association, the wicked man. Evil cannot dwell with him, therefore neither can an evil man dwell with him. And simply, we notice that God hates evil doers. Now this, is, this should be shocking to us in our kindler, gentler, evangelical world. God hates sinners. Okay? God hates sinners. Sinners. It is true. Psalm eleven five. The Lord, uh, the Lord trieth the righteous and the wicked in him that loveth violence. His seal, his soul. I'm sorry. His soul hateth. And we probably heard it said that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. And when in fact these two passages show that that is not true. These, those that do greatly slander God who teach that he will punish sin only because it is opposed to his law and his will, and not because it is opposed to his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable rectitude. So repugnant to God's nature is iniquity that he would not save even his own elect except in such a way that should fully and forever put away both the guilt and the stain of sin and bring all conceivable odium on transgression. God would not even spare his own son when he stood in the place of sinners, lest he might seem to spare sin. Could he cease to hate it, he would cease to be worth of love and confidence. 
nor is it merely some forms of sin that God abhors, but he hates all workers of iniquity. And that quote was by Homer. Now before you start leaving with weeping and gnashing of teeth, know that Romans 5.8 is equally true. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you have this, this really interesting dichotomy in the scriptures where God hates sinners because he hates sin. But also he loves sinners, those to whom he has given his son. Well then, how can God both love and hate sinners? Well, for the sake of time, that we'll leave that for another day. Verse 6, you destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful. God will destroy those whom he hates. He will destroy wicked men, evildoers, boastful, foolish, workers of iniquity, liars and murderers and men of deceit. All that taken from Psalm 5. He will destroy them because he hates them. He abhors them. One theologian says, when God destroys, the ruin is utter, and the wrath is terrible. So God stands to judge sinners. He judges sinners because they are sinful, and he hates sin, and he hates the sinner. But, David says, and this should cause us a moment of rejoicing, but David says in verse 7, I... Through the abundance of your steadfast love. Or if you're reading the authorized version. In the multitude of thy mercy. Will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple. In fear of you. Now we should hear this. David has been revealing the other contempt and hatred of God towards evil men. Of whom we are all included. But says David. He will come to the house of the Lord. When all men be banned from the presence of God because all men are evil and, and God cannot dwell with, it, with evil, David walks into the presence of the Lord. And we ask ourselves, how is this possible? Why can David walk into the presence of the Lord as a sinful man knowing that God hates sinners? God cannot be in the presence of evil. And David's answer is, through the abundance of your steadfast love, or in the multitude of thy mercy. The reason David is able to stand in the presence of God is out of the sheer mercy and grace of God. Spurgeon notes, I will approach with confidence because of thy immeasurable grace. David's assurance is, of, is undoubtedly wrapped up in the faith in God's covenant as is all God's children's hopes. Now this is, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. God is rich in mercy, John Gill explained, abundant in goodness and truth. There is a multitude of mercy, love, and grace in his heart, and which is stored up in his covenant and displayed in his Son, and the provision of him as a Savior of lost sinners. Abundant mercy is shown in regeneration, in adoption, and in the forgiveness of sins, in every spiritual blessing and the gift of eternal life. And now, not relying on his own merits, strength, or righteousness, or leaning upon his own understanding, but trusting in the mercy, grace, and the goodness of God in Christ, and in hope of finding more grace and mercy and help in the time of need, with thankfulness for what he has received, he, being David, or all Christians, determines by divine leave and assistance to enter into the house of the Lord. End quote. This was David's confidence. His confidence was in the mercy and grace of God. In God's mercy, David intends to walk into the temple and worship God with fear and reverence. He continues. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of mine enemies. Make your way straight before me. What a marvelous prayer David prays here. He desires to be led by God according to his righteous ways and righteousness. The very righteousness, by way, in Psalm 4.1 is David's 
And it's what enables him to stand before God. This righteousness is not David's own righteousness. It is the Lord's. David does not desire to be led by his own righteousness because his own righteousness is often found lacking. Our own righteousness is described as dirty rags. Why would you want to follow a failed righteousness? David says, I want to follow. Lead me in your righteousness. David desires to be led by God in a life of righteousness. Furthermore, he says, because my enemies were ever waiting and watching for David to fall. David pleads with God to make a way of righteousness plain before him. For the way of for the way of God is the way that pleases God. And David is asking the Lord to make his righteous way plain to him, so that he may know how to walk in a righteous manner. And David asked the Lord to, to lead him in this way because of uh, his enemies, or because of, in other translations, those that observe me. The idea is that David knows that there are men waiting for him to fall and watching for him to fall. And in doing so, will not only uh, cry out against David as losing the Lord's blessing, but will also cry out and shame the Lord. Because David was his anointed. And we can fast forward to Psalm chapter 23 where David says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That was David's prayer. The Lord answered his prayer. Now David reveals why his enemies are those who observe him, lie in wait and, fall, and, and wait for his falter or his demise. And he says in verse 9, For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Here David summarizes the character of those men who lie in wait, his enemies. There is no faithfulness or no truth in their mouth, David says. This is to say they lie and they are full of lies. Calvin again notes that they, they speak nothing uprightly or in sincerity. And I'm reminded, if you remember from Psalm 3, where he says, Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. They speak nothing truthful, and nor do they care. This was obviously untrue, this, that there's no salvation for David and God, but those who spoke such words didn't regard whether it was true or not, as long as it was against David. Nor was this surprising to David, these men acting this way. As he continues, their inmost self is destruction, or as King James says, their inward part is very wickedness. And David here is pointing out that inwardly they were full of iniquity. Their inward part is completely woeful, execrable, and rottenness. The idea is that they were very rotten, very rotten to the core, utterly depraved, wicked, and sinful. And actually, Jesus picks up this thought in, in Matthew 15, 18, 19, where he says, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. They are so depraved, so rotten, that David says their throat is like an open grave or like an open sepulcher. Plumer puts it, from a corrupt heart comes a foul mouth. The imagery David evokes here is that of a corpse rotting away in a grave that is open. And so because the grave is open, the stench from the rotting corpse filters out through, out into the atmosphere, and it fills the nostrils of passers-by. And so he would say, man, these men, these wicked men, whose inward part is wickedness, naturally and necessarily in their speech, breathe out corruption. In the same way that the stench would come out of a grave, so does corruption come out of these wicked men's mouths and his throats. This verse is actually quoted by Paul in Romans 3, in regards, and he's making the argument in Romans 3, that all men have fallen short, have missed the mark, and that stand before God condemned a sinner. Uh, Horn notes, a, a theologian named Horn, their throat was an open sepulcher, continually emitting an obscene and impious language, the noisome and infectious exhalations of a putrid heart entombed in a body of sin. 
And out of this grave-like throat comes flattery, David says. In all flattery there is deceit. And he says, they flatter with their tongue. Now, in fact, we don't want to lose this, but there is much gravity in the idea of flattery. It is highly offensive to the, to the Lord. I'm almost done, I promise. It's highly offensive to the Lord. Psalm 12, verse 3 notes, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast. And as we have read of the complete depravity that is natural to men, how the redeemed of the Lord should glorify Him all the more, knowing from what corruption God has rescued us. Note this, there was no difference between David and the enemies before God chose him, redeemed him, and saved him. David realizes this. This is why he says, you are the God of my righteousness. The only way I can stand before you is simply because you are merciful. And that you have provided the righteousness for me to stand before you. It's wonderful. Now then, David proceeds to call upon God to do that which is natural for God to do. As he says in verse 6, God destroys evildoers. Thus, David invokes this truth. Make them, he says, bear their guilt. O God, King James says, destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. For they have rebelled against you. There's not much more we need to say about this. It's pretty straightforward. The psalmist is asking God to judge the sinful. The word destroy here in, in the authorized version, it means to make a decision or a judgment, to, to make a judgment against them, to find them guilty. Hence the ESV's reading. David condemns, and he continues, let them fall by their own counsels. And just as Haman was hanged on the gallows he had erected for another person. So the wicked one continually falls by their own devices. David then pleads with the Lord to cast them out because of their rebellion in God. And honestly, this is probably the most extreme language you could ever speak about to another person. David is asking the Lord to cast them out in their sin. That's shocking. That is absolutely shocking. To be cast out amidst their sin, having never repented. Jesus says it this way, you shall die in your sins. To be cast out is final. Your end and destruction is certain. Now for a brief moment, we won't go too far into this again for the sake of time, but consider what David is praying here. This is the first instance in the Psalter that you will find what's called an imprecatory psalm. It is a portion of a psalm or an entire psalm itself in which the psalmist, in this case David, is praying for the destruction of sinful men. Now how are we to take this in light of the New Testament command to love our enemies? Do we have the right to pray destruction upon our enemies? Or would we be rebuked like James and John who prayed destruction against the town and Jesus rebuked them? It's an interesting thought, an interesting discussion, and when we get to a imprecatory psalm, we'll jump into it more deeply. Uh, but for now, it's just a, just a way of start thinking about it. How are we supposed to respond to the wicked? Are we supposed to respond like David and say, God, destroy them, cast them out in their sin? Put them away from you. Or we respond like Jesus. Is there a difference between the two? Interesting thoughts. Now the destruction of the wicked is sure. But, says David, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may exalt in you. The righteous in God rejoice. Why? Because they have taken refuge in God through Christ. The righteous shout for joy. Why? Because the Lord has defended them or spread his protection over them. And not only has God res rescued us from ourselves, from our own personal sin and rebellion, he has and will rescue us from other sinful men. 
This causes the believer, this causes the child of God to love his great name. Therefore, we exalt him. We are joyful in him. Why does God protect and defend all those who take refuge in him? Because, says David in the final verse, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Now we should hear this in closing. God, God, God has already blessed the righteous. Immensely he has blessed us. Because he himself has made us righteous. God has made the righteous righteous. And in that way he has immensely blessed us. We are not righteous in and of ourselves, but God has granted this to us, his own perfect righteousness in Christ. God is, as David says in Psalm 4, 1, the God of our righteousness. Yet, the psalmist says, God continues to bless the righteous with his sovereign protection and favor. Bloomer notes, every good thing the righteous receives from God is of God's grace and sovereign mercy it is a favor, not of debt. That's interesting. We don't deserve it. It's of his favor, of his goodwill. And he says, the righteous deserve no good thing. The righteous, our righteousness is of filthy rags. What they are and what they hope to be is all by the grace of God. This then, in closing, my final paragraph, this then is the righteous, the song of the redeemed. That God has rescued the righteous out of his sheer mercy and grace. And his steadfast love. And not only has God rescued us out of his mercy and grace, but he will lead us, the righteous, in the ways of his righteousness. And not only will God rescue us, or has rescued us, not only will he lead us and continue to lead us, but he will continually bless the righteous and protect them out of his mercy and grace, out of his sheer favor. This is the God to whom David was praying to in Psalm 5. This is the God to whom we worship this morning. This is the God of our righteousness. And again, we are left with the question, are you among the righteous? Or are you among the wicked? The wicked's end is destruction. Yet the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows those who take refuge in him, and he blesses them. All right, and David's commission for us today, if you would, take refuge in Christ. 